Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on such a lovely Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Mary Larson, Associate Dean for Special Collections here at the OSU Library. And I'd like to welcome you to the seventh Plants, People, and Beyond Annual Library Botany Lecture Series. Um, here at the library, we take a broad approach to student support. And while we're a resource for books and journals and databases and study spaces, we also try to be a venue for discovery, inspiration, and education outside of the classroom. And programs like this achieve all of those aspirations. Over the years, we've very much enjoyed our partnership with Botany, which extends beyond this event. Um, in 2009, for example, we launched this speaker series with the unveiling of the Bellamy Parks Jansen Collection. Uh, we secured this extensive collection of Oklahoma botanical illustrations with the help of faculty in the botany department. Not only is this collection an outstanding educational and instructional tool, but it's also the focus of one of the library's internships, uh, a paid student internship. These students work with the collection in our special collections department, and they apply the knowledge that they've gained in their botany coursework to assist with the labeling and processing of this collection. Their work provides our interns with valuable career experience while at the same time adding value to the collection for future students and researchers. Our previous speakers in this series have addressed various aspects of the theme plants, people, and beyond, and topics have ranged from everything from gardening to microbial diversity. And as someone with three degrees in anthropology and an interest in ethnobotany, I'm particularly excited uh, to hear from today's speaker. So to tell you more about him, um, I am going to pass this over to professor and head of botany, Linda Watson. Thank you. So I'd also like to welcome you. We've had a lot of fun with this series and I'm really excited about today's as well. I want to thank our co-sponsors. Um, we have a number of them and that varies year to year, so I like to thank them for that reason. But um, the Department of Integrated Biology, the Department of Natural Resources and Ecology Management, the Environmental Studies Graduate Program, the OSU Botanical Society, which is a student organization, and the Oklahoma Native Plant Society's Cross Timber Chapter have all partnered together to bring um, this event to you. Tonight, um, at 6.15 out at the Botanic Garden, there's also a potluck dinner sponsored by the Oklahoma Native Plant Society and the OSU Botanical Society. So you're all welcome to come to that as well for a second, um, more informal kind of a talk by Dr. Kincher. So I'm excited to introduce Dr. Kelly Kincher to you. He's a professor of environmental studies at University of Kansas. He's also a senior scientist at the Kansas Biological Survey. Um, he has over 100 publications and technical reports. He's an author of three books. Um, two of those um, are, in, are available, Edible Wild Plants of the Prairie and Med Medicinal Wild Plants of the Prairie. His third book is in press with Springer Press on Echinacea, Herbal Medicine with the Wild History. Um, and it should be out, I'm told, sometime later 2015 or early 2016. Um, he's a plant ecologist by training, but also, as he said today, he considers himself more of an ethnobotanist. So kind of an interesting background. So today's talk is, um, Prairie Ethnobotany, the Native Medicinal Plant Research Program, University of Kansas. So Kelly? Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's nice to be in Oklahoma. Great time of year to drive down here across the Kansas Flint Hills, Osage Plains, Flint Flint Hills area, fires, burning prairies, making them dark and black, which is great. I'm glad to be in Stillwater, too. I, I learned recently that this is the home to the game Pente. Everybody know the game Pente? I was hoping that, uh, tell me, is there yet a T. Boone Pickens uh, Pente Museum built yet? Or? <laughs> it's a fun game, though. I, I like it a lot. Um, it's nice to be down here, too. And I actually have quite a few botany colleague friends down here that I should have connected with more previously than I have. So it's fun to be down here for that, too. I'm going to speak to you about our medicinal plant program, which is really a Great Plains program. You'll see quite a bit of Kansas-centric things, but really it's Great Plains-centric. And uh, tonight, for those of you who want to come, I'll speak more about and interact with you more about Echinacea, which is my other uh, plant friend out there. 
I feel I'm a, a product of the Great Plains, and there's a wonderful book by Marie Sandoz that is about her love song to the Plains, and I feel that too, having been born in western Kansas, but spending a lot of time in my uh, father's uh, inherited farm that my great-great-grandfather and grandmother homesteaded in Guidock, Nebraska in 1871. My mom's still on the farm. There's still some native prairie there. My field work has allowed me to do work from really Texas to Canada, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, New Mexico. So I'm always traveling across the plains. And my other claim to fame is uh, after I got my undergraduate degree, a friend and I decided to spend the summer hiking out to the Rocky Mountains. So we literally hiked from Kansas City, Missouri, out to uh, south of Denver, uh, into the Rocky Mountains. It was great. Uh, cross country, roadsides. Uh, I was already a plant nerd, so identifying things as I went and looking at that transition from forest to tall grass prairie, mixed grass prairie, short grass prairie. So I've been fortunate to have a lot of, uh, of prairie experiences and I keep looping back to this uh, great interest of people and plants, and particularly people's uses of plants here in the Great Plains. And that ethnobotany has been an important part of my research. Um, most recently, uh, a colleague in, in medicinal chemistry at the University of Kansas and I embarked upon a research program that focused on botany and medicinal chemistry. And the botany part was deciding what plants we're going to test for anti-cancer, uh, wound healing, uh, antioxidant uh, capabilities. The idea being that no matter where you are, um, we've really overlooked the value of plants. And for those of you involved in conservation at all, we need to keep speaking about the value of plants because many other people don't appreciate that enough. And if we can talk about plants, we're talking about plant communities and conservation. Also, there's just a tremendous amount out there to discover, and I'll share some of that with you today. So I worked with Barbara Timmerman and her lab it's in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry, and, and I have kind of this botany, ethnobotany lab, so uh, we worked together to partner to look at these plants. We started with funding from our state bioscience authority. We've now added on to that. But we also went through some funding woes as state funding is pretty uh, uh, ephemeral these days. So our funding got cut um, partway through it, but we've managed to keep going and do additional work. So the idea was that we would search Kansas plants and look at them, and actually plants from the Great Plains, as uh, vehicles for interesting chemistry that could be used in natural products, in foods, or in pharmaceutical products. We started with an ethic, though, of course, of conservation and sustainability of plants and their harvest, so we deliberately were not going to choose things that were rare because we knew we were going to have discoveries, and if you start with a rare species, you immediately have a problem where do you get enough if it's useful or popular. A key part of our program is looking at uh, indigenous Native American knowledge on medicinal plants. So we want to be respectful of that and view that as really the project is about honoring traditional knowledge. And then again, the conservation message, we would like to see more protection of prairies and those habitats. So we have a very, very rich history of plants and plant uses. My two books documented over 220 species used as medicine by Native Americans in the Great Plains, over 100 species used as food. Now, if you think about that for a minute, that's more than twice as many plants used as medicine, native plants, as used for food. Do um, you have any ideas why that might be? Why are there so many more medicinal plants than edible plants? Anybody have an idea on that? They taste <laughs> That's true. You know, uh, and you bring up something and it'll help me answer this. So I was really pleased when I wrote my edible plant book. I have actually tasted all those edible plants. And some of them don't taste that great. Uh, many of them are neutral. Some are kind of tea plants, so you wouldn't expect, you know, a strong mint, let's say, to taste great. Um, but most of them are pretty good, and most all of them you can understand how they'd be sustenance. With the medicinal plants, I can't claim I've tried them all. You'd have to be at least a hypochondriac. You'd have to also, like, I've never given birth. 
I've not had a whole lot of different diseases. And if you start thinking about all the maladies out there, you can realize that, well, there's a lot of things you'd want to treat for, so a need for a lot of different plants. Also, Native Americans and lots of medicines use multiple medicinal plants for any treatment. So some of those plants that are used may not be even the primary thing used. So you have polypharmacy, as we'd call it, for looking at medicine. So there's lots of reasons why lots of plants were used. And we don't feel like we've documented all of them. I'm still finding more. I'm doing a lot of historical research these days, uh, looking at early journals of uh, obvious people, Lewis and Clark, but other folks that went up the river, Missouri River into the Southwest. I'm reading early ethnobotanist literature like Melvin Gilmore, some of the anthropologists, archeologists that worked with tribes. Uh, and due to that, I'm finding a lot more specific tribal uses. For example, uh, Melvin Gilmore interviewed some Osage elders in the 19, uh, late 20s and 30s. And I've now seen notes and have those notes, copies of them, of those interviews, and there's probably at least 20 to 30 species of plants that I've not seen recorded uh, for use by the Osage. So there's a lot of other information out there, historical, and there's a lot of current information too. Uh, I was just back up on the Rosebud Reservation this past summer, visiting friends from uh, way back. I did interviews and spent time with elders in the uh, 1980s, 1990s. There's still a lot of medicinal plant use on reservations today that we don't recognize or honor. I've always been focused on prairies, um, grasslands. So you can see in the world map, the yellow areas are grasslands of some sort. Uh, the green map of this part of the United States, of course, are prairies, tall grass prairie, tall mixed grass prairie, depending on you map it. Uh, the Flint Hills of Kansas, or your Osage Hills down here, still harbor lots of acreage of prairie, which is wonderful. We still have that. You know, we're in really in part of the world that can say we still have prairies because the agricultural imager shows you that we've really converted most of our prairies into crop fields. So on the botany side of our project, as an ethnobotanist, we decided to use an ethnobotanical screen. So the plants that we were going to collect had medicinal uses. Ideally, we wanted to collect plants for additional testing that had uses that support what we were wanting to collect. But especially for the anti-cancer work, we did not find, our database does not show plants being used much for cancer at all, historically. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, one of which is that, honestly, Native Americans had healthier lives than we do today. They weren't exposed to as many of the substances that we are today. We know that uh, many of those uh, do cause cancer. Uh, in addition, people didn't live quite as long, so sort of less old age cancers. But most importantly, cancer really is a modern conception. Um, it's something that is really, I would argue, a product of the development of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, cancer is many diseases, it's not just one. In fact, we have different medications for different types of cancer, which recognizes that. Cancer, of course, is uh, cells that are out of control and growing wildly. That ought, wouldn't always be recognized the same thing by Native Americans, especially as internal. Internal cancers might not get recognized. And more specifically, cancers were recognized as associated with the part of the body that they were on. A skin cancer would be a skin problem uh, and, and recorded as that. Um, sometimes there was talk of lumps or things. Of course, it wasn't framed as cancer. If it was internal, it was an internal problem. It might get associated with an organ, but it wouldn't be associated with the words cancer. So we screened a tremendous amount of uh, historical work. We used uh, some existing databases. We have about about 10,000 entries into our database that separate out by tribe, by plant, and by use. So we then ventured out to collect things for the chemists to work with, and we ended up picking about 200 different species. To collect plants, we deliberately went to public lands, so it would be easier to revisit. So National Wildlife Refuges were a place where we could get wetland plants in this case. But there aren't many wildlife refuges in Kansas or in Oklahoma. Um, not a lot of land. Went to the national grassland that we have in Kansas. We have one. Um, Oklahoma, I believe, has a couple out, out west, but those are areas we could easily get permits from the Forest Service to collect. This is uh, Cimarron National Grasslands out in southwest Kansas. 
Once we collected species, though, we always have to check their identification, spend a lot of time in the field making identifications. Of course, more important than our field ID is that we made voucher specimens of everything. Collection was uh, a lot of work, difficult. We needed uh, at least a kilo of dried plant material for the chemists. They like lots of material, so over two pounds of dried plant material which meant 15 or 20 pounds of a lot of material, which means that with some small plants, it was a tremendous amount of work. We like things that are big plants, or we like big roots. Um, because some plants are so small, I'll talk about our garden. We actually grew quite a few things out because sometimes that was just an easier way to facilitate getting the material that we needed. So I mentioned we made uh, herbarium vouchers, and that went with part of our data. GPS our locations, uh, have a big extensive data sheet that talked about uh, collections, the plant material, the parts used. We tried to collect the parts that were used for medicine, so if it was a root that was used, we wanted to collect the roots. Often we'd get the just above ground plant material. Uh, all of our herbarium vouchers are uh, at the KU Herbarium. We use state lands, state parks, we often had difficulty finding places to stay when you work out west, <laughs> places to eat, but we suffered through that. Got to visit some great reserves. This is the Guadalcanal Memorial Reserve of the Prairie Plains Resource Institute in Nebraska, way out in northwest Nebraska, adjacent to Wyoming and South Dakota. And it was important to us to go to different types of landforms because you pick up different plants. This is on the Ogallala Formation uh, material out there at about almost 5,000 feet. We spent a lot of time chopping, clipping, drying because mold is not our friend. If we have moldy plants, not only those make bad herbarium vouchers, make them hard to identify, one of my greatest fears was is that the chemist would discover some new compound and find out it was actually fungal in origin rather than the plant itself. Um, so we, and we didn't want to dry plants under much heat because we wanted to make sure we had lots of good content. So we spent a lot of time chopping things and spreading them out. Roots, if it's sandy, were easy to dig, like this one, American licorice. This is just one plant that was kind of fun to work with. By the way, in some of the chemistry work we've done, we have an anti-TB compound that's found in the roots of this plant. Chopping. Roots need to be in small pieces. On tarps, usually uh, would go somewhere and find a storage building or a research facility, chop up plants, turn the fans on, and work that area for a couple, three days. Sometimes we did that in motels, but we had an unfortunate incident in doing that in southwest Kansas. You know, sometimes you go to these motels and they have the big sign that they're American owned, and of course they are. And in this case, it was one of the Indian immigrant families that uh, moved to the U.S. were citizens, and they owned this place. And we were out for the day, and we had a couple tarpfuls of plants that we left on top of the bed. Of course, we, you know, out to dry with fans on in the room. And of course, you put out the do not disturb sign. But always, of course, the, you know, service has to come in and, you know, freshen things up or check on you. So we got back, and the lights flashing on the phone, had to go to the front office desk and it's like they were convinced we had marijuana and we said no we're collecting plants hey we're from the University of Kansas and showed them a card and they did not believe us we got kicked out mold's not our friend we've collected in the Black Hills but days like this just run your collecting days so went to great habitat Sand Hills Nebraska look at those great hills Rare plants, we avoided them. We saw them, we saw the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid on these works. Another not National Wildlife Refuge, High Plains, Cherry County, Nebraska. Bush Morning Glory, great plant. Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas. It's a Morning Glory family plant, perennial. Um, gets about three feet tall. Just curious, semi-plant nerds we have here. Who knows this plant? A couple, three of you. Uh, it's a rather remarkable plant, like sands. Um, Great morning glory flower, and has these big roots that Quinn was digging here and went all the way in to get. 
And there it is, huge root. We like these things. Then we found, you know, there's been lots of people explore plants. There was this uh, uh, European uh, Botanical Congress that was out exploring plants in the high plains. And here's a picture of this uh, botanist, Carl Schroeder, in 1913, holding his plant up in a similar pose. We found this later. I do like his little bench. I don't quite understand that, but he's elevated by about a foot. <laughs> And they had this whole expedition that was out. I thought this was great. We don't do enough, though, speaking of us botanists here in the crowd, we don't do enough of these things, these international forays and such. I, I think that was a, a, a great thing. So we record information on our plant. Uh, I was talking about this today. This is one of the plants that does have annual growth rings. Very few of our plants have annual growth rings except for trees. But there are a few root things that do. Um, and of course, that makes it really useful for studying populations and over time. Uh, but the reason this is cut, not because we were looking for the growth rings, we grind our plant material. You can't take a big root like that and grind it, and especially these big roots, they really are woody. So if you dry them out, it's need to dry them. Plus it helps to dry them by cutting them up. Buffalo gourds, another big root we enjoy digging because these things weigh a lot. There's a, a really nice Omaha story uh, about the buffalo gourd. And they believe it's kind of, it's a little bit similar to the, the Asian ideas about ginseng, that these are really kind of human-shaped roots and that they have special powers because of that and that you really should be really careful when you dig them because you don't want to damage the part of the root because the root is conformed. So perhaps if it's a forked root, like the two legs of a person and if there's a third part, you can guess what that goes to. But you don't want to damage these because you might inflict damage on someone around you. We weren't that careful, though. But Cutting roots. Yucca is a good plant to dig up to. We had some ideas that didn't pan out, but you'll catch the drift on this. Um, so if you're interested in plant compounds, some plants do some crazy things. Like this is a uh, daughter. It's a plant parasite. How many of you know it? There's several species, but these little orange things that are, you know, just show up usually late summer and fall. They're usually species specific. Um, but what's interesting about them, and I read on this some, is that they're one of these plants that is pretty risky. They exchange bodily fluids with other species readily. And I'm sort of joking about this, but they have to have added protection. So we thought this may, may be interesting for showing up something that is of interest to us. It didn't, but it's a pain because these things are just threads. There's like no structure there. They don't weigh much. It takes a long time to gather them. Dried them out. Yeah, look at that. There it is, big pile of it. Cucklebur. Um, by the way, cucklebur seeds have been eaten as food, but they're not, they're not great. Lobelia syphilitica, right? Great name, right? It was used to treat syphilis. Bone set, tall bone set, uh, another species. This is just common bone set. Of course, bone set was not used to knit bones. Bone set has a much more interesting story. Bone set uh, actually is a pretty good uh, immune stimulant. Stimulates the immune system. There's some uh, studies that show compound, there's a large uh, carbohydrate that's uh, immunostimulant. And its story is that horrible flu epidemic in 1918, probably the worst one this country's ever experienced. We believe it's actually started at Fort Riley in Kansas, or the mutation took off from there. And it was one that, I don't know, like 10,000 people died. It was really, really bad. And so there was not really anything too effective for it. But some of the herbalists, more traditional peoples realized that uh, this plant, bone set, uh, was a good remedy. And it has a long history of being used for colds and flu and sickness. And I'm rather certain it relates to that immune stimulant. And it was so effective that people used it extensively. And when you get the really bad flu, you know, sometimes your bones literally ache, your body aches, bones almost hurt. And this was the cure for the, what was called the bone break fever. So if you consumed enough of this, you might get over that flu. So it was used, and now we have some uh, chemi chemistry support that that may have indeed not just been an old wives' tale or herbal thought, but had some actual validity to it. 
course, my favorite plant's echinacea. We threw it in the mix, too, and I'll speak more about it tonight, but it's our, it's our winner in terms of Great Plains medicines that uh, has global fame. Uh, echinacea is, is used extensively in Europe where their medical system is much more progressed than ours because they've integrated herbal medicine with uh, uh, medicine that we experience today. So if you go in a German pharmacy, you can buy echinacea products rather readily. And echinacea is not native Germany, it has to be imported. These bundles are not uh, our camping gear. Um, this is uh, Osha Laguscum porteri in the back. Those are rolls of plants, so stuff doesn't get quite dry, we actually traveled with. And we brought stuff back to our lab. This is how our lab looked in the fall. Still drawing plants. Labs are great, especially when you have nice fume hoods in the room where you get air exchange every two minutes. Any moisture in those plants gets sucked out. So our grinding uh, apparatus. Did it outside. Had to excruciatingly clean this thing because you cannot have any small amounts. Uh, part of my you know, message is we've got a lot of discovery. Uh, again, things that worried me is we can't have cross-contamination of plants because the chemists are dealing with parts per million, parts per billion in finding stuff. So any type of contamination is a problem. I'm very supportive of or organic food, organic gardening uh, for a lot of reasons. We made sure our gardens uh, did not have sprays because I was really afraid, what if we have a hormonal substance in some of these plant materials and come to find out it's, you know, spray drift. So these are the, the bags of plant material that was ground. We kept back samples besides herbarium samples. We kept back to DNA sample, which also was kind of a fail-safe sample because, you know, if you do work with other labs, you can never trust them entirely and at some point they're going to get confused. Plants, ground, how are you going to tell what it is? We kept back some extra samples so we could compare. But they were good. They, they, they didn't have any mistakes that I know of. Then the chemistry part, um, this is just a flow chart. I'm going to leave it at that. But we did essentially the extracts and tested all four extracts. We have a high throughput screening lab at the university. So for some of our screens, our anti-cancer screen, they could run large samples all at the same time. And it's all automated on computer. They're still slow, though. Amazing how long it takes to get this stuff done. So our winner was a weed. Um, this is what I now call wild tomatillos. Uh, this plant, of the 220 species that we screened of native plants from across the Great Plains, this plant, which grows down here too, uh, was our highest in our two antioxidant tests. We think of antioxidants, you think about vitamin C, you think about oranges, um, but antioxidants are common throughout, throughout the plant world. There's also a nice relationship between antioxidants and anti-cancer compounds. So we were working directly with our medical center and they expressed interest in our lead candidates. And uh, this plant, uh, which has this attractive flower of the wild tomatillos, this is one of the perennials that doesn't have many hairs at all, but if you look carefully, there are small lines of hairs that point downward. It's what's based on the keys. Here's the range. It is everywhere that is green on the map, green and yellow. I mean, it's in every state in the United States. Uh, the light, uh, lighter green counties have more than one species. So you can see it's really a Midwestern species, commonly collected has these green berries. And this is one of those plants that, going back to my edible plant book, I was not very excited about. I didn't think it tasted very good. We still have lots to learn in working with plants, um, but it just kind of tasted like green stuff. And that's because I wasn't eating ripe fruit. These plants are pretty closely related to tomatoes. So, you know, it'd be like, having you come over to my house and I've got some green tomatoes and I say, have you ever eaten a tomato? And you say, no, and I hand you a green tomato. You bite into it and you go, well, those aren't very good. Then of course, someone would tell you, well, you can fry them. But if you really want a good tomato, you want a ripe tomato, right? So I didn't realize that. I mean, it's obvious, but these little fruits are husk covered for a long time and they are very slow to ripen. In fact, they hardly ripen uh, by the frost. They just sit there. 
So we collected lots of these and they actually took a month or longer to ripen in our lab. And we always chop stuff up to dry, which I was talking about, but it's pain, it takes time. Got these little fruits, I don't wanna, you know, have students or lab people spend a bunch of time chopping up small fruits we don't need to. They just sat there for two months, nothing. Just kind of green and they started to turn yellow. And then they got ripe. And then they got sweet. Just like tomatoes go from being green and kind of nasty tasting, not sweet, not flavorful, to actually wild tomatillos, most all the species, uh, get sweet and tasty. I've done taste tests on these and we've tried to describe them or somewhat like a sweetened uh, dried cranberry, a little bit like a dried strawberry, somewhere in there. They're really pretty good. And this is a handful of ripe ones that you'll see in a little bit. Lots of seeds. You can see the seeds in here. These things are very prolific weeds, long-lived perennials. They spread. Prolific seed producers. I don't know why I took pictures. Seeds have pits. They're kind of fun to look at. They have a long history. The seeds and fruits have long as being used as food. They are common in archaeological sites. They are also commonly reported in the ethnobotanical literature. They're still used as food. I have a student who worked with me in my lab who is a Haskell Indian Nations University student, and we had a special exchange program. We're in the same town, so we have quite a few students come work in our labs. He is from the Jemez Pueblo, and we got to be pretty good friends. And, uh, I got to go out there and visit him and his family later, and he took me out in their cornfields. They still have about 2,000 acres of traditional corn that they're growing uh, where they live. And in those cornfields, they're still uh, encouraging these wild tomatillos. In fact, there's a long history of this. People have always recognized good foods to eat. Traditionally, corn's grown. If you have uh, pigweeds, lamb's quarters, you don't hoe those out. That's food, right? So I was pleased to see that. And then in the ethnobotany literature, you read about large amounts of these fruits were harvested in the fall. They were pounded, crushed a little bit, made into like fat pancakes and dried, and then used in soup or stew later, maybe with some nice bison meat, maybe with some prey turnips and wild onions and stuff like that for a nice stew. Uh, and then we find seeds. Lots of archeological sites have wild tomatillo seeds uh, in their deposits and they get charred if you use food around where you cook on an open fire anytime people cook they spill things burn things well that's what archaeologists find are that really usually the charred food remains because most of our food spoils rots disappears especially in the great plains you know we don't have many caves and dry places so archaeology is much harder so these are found extensively now in the archaeological sites it's hard to tell which species you have. And one of the problems working with this genus, uh, Thistilus, is that they're very confusing. Even I'm humbled at times. Um, we have about, I think Oklahoma probably has, I would guess, eight to 10 species. There's annuals and perennials. Some of them are a little bit different, um, but some of them are very, very similar. Um, there's not a good treatment out there yet. It hasn't been written for the floor of North America yet, but it's in the works. There's not good uh, uh, genomic work either yet. So we're kind of still guessing a little bit um, of what's what, but I can say this, that all the fruits are edible. I can also tell you that the chemistry though is different between species. The species we worked with, I mentioned had this very high uh, antioxidant level and we did more work with that. Um, the uh, cancer lab over at the University of Kansas Medical Center said, this is exciting. This is scoring very high in our anti-cancer screens. We need to work more with this. So we collected a lot more plant material and the chemists extracted it. And during that process, I recognized that that chemistry was not just in the foliage, it was also in the fruit. Um, and the species are related to a plant that's interestingly used in India, ashwagandha. If you're an herbalist, you may have heard of ashwagandha. There's a compound in that called withafarin A. And we found similar compounds in this plant. Withafarin A is known to be anti-cancer too. So in our work, we discovered a whole series of new compounds. We've now published uh, 
17 new compounds that are with anagolides, that's our name for them, uh, in this plant. And more than one of them are anti-cancer. What's exciting about the anti-cancer part, too, is that we are now seeing tumor reduction and tumor size reduction for a couple, three different types of cancer, uh, neck, uh, head, squamous cell cancer. Uh, we have success with thyroid cancer, breast cancer, lymph node cancer. We actually, I uh, think this will be published, have the first record of showing a decrease in size of lymph node cancer uh, tumor. Uh, that's not been reported before. The MD I, we work with, uh, who's now at the University of Michigan, I said, well, that's a sample size of one. You think that's, I don't think that's publishable, is it? He says, well, in our field, uh, we publish new results. So I guess that's gonna be published as an example. I like that. I, I often feel very strongly that we need lots of replication in science. And of course, we need to replicate that more with other human studies, which are going on now, and with more animal model studies. We have worked with rats, too. Uh, kind of gruesome, but uh, they have uh, lines of rats now that have induced tumors. And as I said, the, the compound is not just in the foliage, it's in the fruits. So we have uh, rats that were force fed these wild tomatillo fruits and we have tumor size reduction. Very excited about that. Um, this project's still ongoing, but it's kind of slowed down. The chemistry and the discovery have been patented. I'm kind of relieved I'm not part of that patent process. I have problems with patents, um, but that's where our medicine has gone. Um, I'm hopeful this could be marketed as a natural product. We do have a food that people could eat legally. Um, that would be more the model I would like to see used. But to become a true pharma product, we need more safety and efficacy data. So some of those studies are going on, but other studies are very, very expensive. Um, so the core research team is trying to drum up money for that. And you do that by getting some large company interested in the product. So we're working on kind of preliminary expanded studies to see where that interest goes. As I mentioned, we've been growing things out, including we started growing out a lot more of this wild tomatillo. We've uh, been growing out uh, several other plants that were hard for us to get. This is our garden, it's 2010, but it doesn't look all this different. It's also been a very good educational tool. So we're growing everything from New England Astra up front to Rattlesnake Master in the middle, that wild bone set. We have nettles, um, a whole bunch of other things. We've done a lot of work with tomatillos. We also uh, looked at several other species. Uh, we've published uh, new compounds and other species of wild tomatillos or fissilis, um, but none of those were as exciting. Um, those uh, had compounds in them that were as interesting to the chemists and to the medical people we work with. We've also done a lot of work on milkweeds. Uh, we're at a time when there's great interest in milkweeds, and of course, milkweeds are one of my favorite spring foods even though they're a poisonous plant. Anyone else here eating milkweed? Hey, good. Um, I learned about this from my uh, Native American friends. They love milkweed in soup. Uh, the flower buds or the young shoots, which are, do have these cardiac glycosides in them, um, but if you boil them, those uh, are water soluble and mostly disappear, drain the water, and it's really tasty. It's very sweet, very sweet greens, um, and nice addition to soup. So we, even though milkweeds have been looked at a lot, um, there's still a lot of chemistry in them that's not been discovered. Um, uh, on this trip, I'm actually reviewing a paper we'll submit, and I'm pretty sure it'll be published. We have new compounds in uh, Asclepius solivantii, solivants milkweed. We've got new compounds we've published on uh, common milkweed and also on a narrow leaf milkweed. Um, where medicinal chemistry is at now is the technology is just so much better than it was 20, 30 years ago that new discovery can be made. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity for uh, new compounds. Some of those seem slightly useful. The milkweed's not gonna go anywhere, although we do have some low-level anti-cancer activity in some of the milkweed compounds, but not exciting to the researchers we're working with. 
So we've been propagating a lot of plants. Uh, I think this is part of our Fistulus propagation here. We uh, ended up the uh, Fistulus, we were wanting to see, well, two things. The chemists needed more plant material. We're gonna work on this thing a lot. Um, so we decided to put this into an experimental design. They just need content of leaves and above ground material. Uh, we'd collected uh, four different populations for them uh, to test. And the variety that we ended up propagating in the field right here, unfortunately for us, was the weakest of the four in content, which we didn't know at the time we were propagating them. Uh, like 20% weaker than the better stuff, um, just by chance. Uh, in terms of secondary compounds in plants, we generally uh, believe that they're produced not for human benefit, but to ward off being eaten or for plant protection. Of course, plants have thorns, they have uh, spiny stuff, they have ways of protecting themselves, and we believe that the chemistry they produce is often to protect themselves. And primarily that protection's against insects. That's why plants actually have a lot of insecticides. And of course, we're not very far removed from insects, if you think about it. Um, for example, I mean, how many of you feel comfortable drinking or using pesticides, right? Almost all the insecticides uh, are not good for us. We're closely related enough that you really don't want to be around those compounds. Um, so we believe most of these secondary compounds in various ways are trying to ward off insects. And we have proof of that. It's interesting when you bring these prairie plants we consider very tough and, you know, able to withstand things into the common garden, you get a lot of insect problems. We had things devastating our wild tomatillos, these weeds that are prolific. We've had problems with asters being eaten up. I'm thinking, asters, how can we have insect problems with them? Bringing things in close, populations boom, not surprising, I kind of knew that. Um, but yet here's proof of it. So we did this experiment looking at secondary compounds. We had different treatments. We mulched all of them except one set. We had a control. Uh, we tried uh, introducing some mycelium into the wood chips, see if we could get some synergistic action. We had a fertilizer treatment and we had essentially no significant differences. One of those research things you do where no differences are kind of like, that's too bad. Um, but what we did have is that all of this cultivated material was much lower in content than those four locations. So we figured out some ways to do some comparisons there and show that the better situation, we were making these plants more tender, more tasty, uh, they grew faster, they had less content. This is a nice plant to propagate. <clears throat> I went back out to the uh, population to get some. We found by digging them up that I could take root pieces of these, uh, their rhizomatous plants, just an inch long and they would sprout if you take them to the greenhouse. So I thought, I'll go back out to that population. It's the best and we'll start propagating that. So I thought, you know, good time to go out there. It's late winter, March. Uh, we had a GPS location where it was and it happened to be that the strongest one was actually a roadside collection. Because we got in the fizzles, we just had to get a bunch. So we had a roadside collection. I drove out to central Kansas to get this plant and our DOT had mowed the roadsides to stubble. So I had to go back out two months later, dug it up, and I was able to make root cuttings. I got like 50 of them, almost all of them sprouted. So we now have production on the larger content one too. So we've been collecting lots of fruit because we're very interested in seeing the fruit used. We published our ethnobotany and economic botany. Most of the chemistry work is in a series of different chemistry journals. We have uh, three published articles on the chemistry now. We've also engaged students in our work. Um, our medicinal plant garden is also a site for the KU student farm. The students decided to call it a farm, even though there's no livestock yet, um, although they're getting bees. Um, but just the concept that students now want to grow things, they want to work with plant materials, they're thinking food security um, and nutrition. We've done a lot of outreach with our program. Um, we, like I said, Haskell's in town, so we've done a lot of classwork with them. Another fun project with this is we have a new School of Pharmacy building. We got engaged in the landscaping, 
And I said, well, why don't we build a medicinal plant garden? All these medicinal plants were part of modern medicine. There's still educational value. So we got to plant a garden, which I felt was pretty subversive. We're showing all these herbs in front of the School of Pharmacy right outside the food court. <laughs> we, had a, we had a precedent for this. So this is the KU Drug Garden of the 1930s. It was on campus where the, this is for the chemistry department. They didn't have a medicinal chemistry department then. And they grew out all sorts of things. Uh, we had several pictures of it. We were able to get a list of the plants made. I'll go back a picture. Um, if you look there in the back, there are some tall marijuana plants. They grew marijuana and poppies uh, back for you know, use as looking at them as representative medicinal plants. For the new school of pharmacy garden, we did not add those two plants. It's kind of interesting to think about that, how those would become taboo. Um, of course, and I've published on this actually, my bigger concern is our plants would disappear in the night. And as a gardener, you hate to see your plants mess with. But we've planted the rest as an educational facility. These are some of the students and staff that have worked with us. We do have tours. We haven't set a spring tour, um, but we'll probably do one in June, another one in September. Of course, you're all invited, but it's a little bit of a trek. Um, and we do have a, a website. So if you're interested in learning more about our project, just look up uh, Native Medicinal Plants, my name, um, University of Kansas, some of that, and you'll get to us. We have a lot more information there. And I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you.